down the sidelines. I guess you could say that Mike Ditka is intense. I think it would be a fair appraisal, uh, sometimes controversial, but he is one hell of a football player, and he's been in the NFL for the past 25 years. Been part of six Super Bowl wins, one as a player, four as assistant coach, and of course, last year, as head coach of the Chicago Bears. This is his autobiography. Would you welcome Mike Dicta? <laughs> You probably thought you were in the bowl again this year, right? Yeah, I have to learn to bark better. <laughs> <coughs> okay. First question. Is Jim McMahon nuts? <laughs> oh, we'll get back to that later. Uh, <laughs> we'll follow up. I had Jim here a couple of weeks ago. We'll, I want to get some comments on him. But you are in the news lately, uh, as you know. Um, your friend and, and, and general uh, partner, uh, Vanesky, was, uh, was fired, right? And you made a lot of statements about you were going to quit and you, were the, you thought it was unfair and uh, so forth and so on. You want to expound a little bit on what's Well, going I, on? John, I, I think when you're, you know, you're always hurt when you lose a good friend and uh, when you don't understand the reason behind it. But uh, I think uh, I learned as a kid that, uh, you know, the guy who owns the ball and bat, he can call the game anytime he wants to. Right. And uh, so I accept that. You know, I, I think it would be silly of me to give up something that I love very dearly, which is the Chicago Bears and coaching. Uh, just to follow Jerry because he's my good friend. I think at the end of this season, uh, I'll reevaluate the situation. But I think uh, I would like to put the Bears back into another Super Bowl. Not that I'll do it, but I think the players want to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, the press, of course, loves this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they, they thrive on this kind of controversy. Uh, uh, were you sorry for anything that you said at all, or did you say things when you were a little steamed up and then start to reevaluate? I, I think you do. You say things when you well, I say a lot of things anyways. I mean, uh, the only guy that says more things to me is McMahon, so. We're, we're, we're going to get, we're going to get to That's not it either. I'm no. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I think you do. And I, when you're hurt, you say things. I think when you reevaluate the situation, you know, my, you know, it's, my whole life revolves around the Bears. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, I have any dreams of, uh, you know, working on Wall Street or coaching in another city. I don't. Right. And when Mr. Hallis gave me that opportunity, it meant a lot to me. And it meant a lot to repay some of the confidences he had in me. So that's why it's important to me. I would say that uh, I'm behind the eight ball a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> so you think maybe this time next year you'll still be uh, coaching Prob Chicago? Probably. I'm, I'm not smart enough to do anything else. No, come on. <laughs> down on. Yeah. We had Jim McMahon on this show a, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I brought up your name. I said, uh, tell me about Mike Ditka. And I kind of get this glassy look uh, that Jim occasionally gets, and <clears throat> we really didn't get into it. He, um, he said, well, you know, Mike is, uh, Mike's Mike. And, uh, so, uh... I don't think, uh, you know, I, I could say a lot of things. I don't think Jim really likes me, but I don't, he doesn't like me just because it's me. I don't think it's because I'm in the position I'm in as a coach. You said, and, you, and he, you said he don't think he likes you. No, I don't think he does. You know, I think people try to tell me he does, but I think he defies authority. And I just happen to be the coach, so there has to be a certain amount of authority there. And uh, I, I think that's the main reason, period. Yeah. I don't think it's anything else. Uh, he accuses me of changing personalities, but, you know, heck, you got to do that, John. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, Didn't the players call you Sybil at one time? <laughs> no, not, not as, no, not as an effeminate gesture because of the change of personalities. No, no, that really wasn't the reason. Oh. I wore, uh, I changed dresses three times <laughs> in one day. Nobody's perfect, big deal. <laughs> so, um, how do you, how do you, how do you, what's your communication with him during the game? Well, during the game, uh, it, it's been good and bad, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes, uh, you know, Jim does no wrong on the field. I mean, he really, uh, he's an excellent football player when he's healthy, and he has a great understanding of the game on yeah. the field. Uh, when he does do something wrong, it was pretty hard to say that he did anything wrong because yeah. he's not going to listen to me, that's for sure. And maybe he's the kind of guy that, that I shouldn't tell him he did something wrong until maybe next week. Yeah. But uh, I'm not that kind of guy, so... Do you think... <laughs> do you think there are certain personalities in athletics that kind of live on the edge, uh, that they need that kind of crisis around them all the time to make them perform? I mean, to, 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 to get them up. 
Well, I think he, he probably does. Thrives on it. Yeah. He's, uh, he, he's different, but I tell you, Dagon, when you look at the, the bottom line, when he goes out to play, he plays the game uh, very much different than anybody at that position, Johnny. Right. He has no regard for his health or his body. He, he tries to play it like a lineman. Yeah. And usually it doesn't work out because, you yeah. know, he's only 190 pounds or 95 pounds, and those guys are like 270, 280, and they throw him around pretty good. Yeah. Do you hope he'll be uh, quarterbacking next I year? Just he think the show, I the think he'll be injury. back. I think he's going to work at it. I think he knows how important it is to his career, and I think he'll probably come back and uh, make me look bad or make me look good. <laughs> <laughs> he'll make me look good because he'll play good. That's what I meant. It'll work out. I get the feeling sometimes when I, when I watch you on the sideline that the players are not so concerned about getting injured on the field. <laughs> as they are when they come to the sidelines and you and you give them instructions uh, well there have you, been a, you get their attention i mean well there have been a few flying clipboards but i i've kind of cut that down quite a degree yeah. i mean i i don't throw them quite as much anymore but no i i really i i try to you know john i try to get involved in the game be myself and when i'm not myself and i wasn't myself the last football game i right. didn't say a word to anybody and which I, I got so much criticism for that from fans say, go ahead, be yourself. Yeah. And then, then some little school teacher in Idaho writes me, says, you can't holler at those guys. I can't holler at my students. Why can you all? I don't know. I don't know who's right. But I yeah. think from now on, I will be myself. I'll try to tone it down a little bit. Yeah. Well, you, I think you said once, I think you say it in your book, that you don't care really whether your players will like you. That that's really not important from a coach's standpoint, true? Well, I would hope that they respect me and, and they think I'm, I'm dealing fair. If, yeah. if they think I'm not being fair, then I've got a problem because I have to relate fairness to them. As far as liking, I mean, I think what everybody's talking to, do you go out and socialize with the players? Yeah, yeah I've sat down with players socially and I, I've sat down with Jim socially, but I don't think it's a good policy. I yeah. don't think it's something that uh, you can make a living doing. I think they have to understand that that's my job and it's my... I'm an authority rule to them. Sometimes that bothers them and sometimes it threatens them, but that's life. I have to be that. Yeah, you can't win a popularity contest, no. I guess, at any time when you're a coach. Well, I'm not going to win one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the big game coming up. I just talked to Joe Morris of the Giants uh, uh, backstage here, who's probably one of the main reasons the Giants are in the Super Bowl because of his running. How, how do you see the game coming up between Bronco and... Uh... Well, it's going to be... A, the two teams that are in it deserve to be there. They, they, you know, they definitely <clears throat> prove they're the best in the league. I think... Uh, it's going to be an interesting game from one view. I think it'll probably be the most physical Super Bowl in a long time from the defensive aspect. I think they're two yeah. good, hard-hitting defenses. You know, it, it's hard to say who's going to win it. The, there's no question that the Broncos have to try to stop Morris and put some pressure on Sims and, and then control the other guy, Taylor, on defense and the other guy on the other yeah. side, Banks. So, but I, I think Elway uh, has a thing about him. I think Coach Reeves has a thing about him. And I really believe in it. If there's any such thing as a team of destiny, maybe the Broncos are a team of destiny. Yeah. yeah. They got yeah. my vote. I don't know why. Yeah. Elway can take a, a broken play and turn it into something big. Anyway, we have to, take, we have to cut away for a break here? We should. All right. We will, and we'll be right back. Stay where you are. The unpopped kernel. A small disappointment, but one that popcorn lovers could do without. Fortunately, there is a microwave popcorn that won't disappoint you. Pop Secret from Betty Crocker. Pop Secret leaves very few unpopped kernels, and it works in any microwave. So if you want big fluffy kernels, not big disappointments, buy Pop Secret. The secret to great microwave popcorn. Pasadena, another Super Bowl, and I'm out for the season. No Miracle Whip. I can handle it. A sandwich? Even McMahon's isn't a sandwich without the tangy zip of Miracle Whip salad dressing. Whoa, things are looking up. There is an eye that doesn't rest. The eye of fidelity and the vision of Fidelity's Magellan Fund, colossus that towers over the investment world. Over 600,000 of your neighbors put their trust in Fidelity Magellan and prospered with the decade's top performing equity fund. From discount brokerage through mutual funds. Share the vision. Fidelity Investments. Jim Mitchell's eyes, intensely green, 
slightly astigmatic, according to doctor's exam. Prefers scratch-resistant plastic lenses with bronze wire frames. Jim Mitchell's eyes. Corrected, handsome, and proud. Pearl knows how glasses work. Pearl cares how glasses look. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. back. It's just time to thank everybody. <clears throat> Mike, it's nice having you here tonight. Thank you for dropping thank in. Thank you, John. Hope you enjoy it. the game. You're a pleasure to watch as a player, and it's fun to watch you coach. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good luck. Time. I hope you're back in Chicago. <laughs> Jerry, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to the Dallas Improv next month. I want to mention that. Okie dokie. That's I got to get some line. more airline jokes. I'm going to okay. keep flying. Tomorrow night, we have Robert Klein, a uh, song by Phyllis Hyman and Granny Policeman. Barbara Shine. Shine, right. She'll be with us. Thank you all. We'll see you tomorrow. Next on Late Night with David Letterman, David welcomes the one and only Sammy Davis Jr. Then start your day with NBC News at sunrise. And tomorrow morning on Today, I look at the film Platoon and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. A night on the town with the Pointer Sisters. I'm so Bruce Willis moonlighting with Whoopi Goldberg and the Pointer Sisters up all night Friday. Outnumbered and out.